Good evening. Good evening, faculty, staff, students, administrators, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Wickline, and I have the privilege of serving as president of the Academic Senate at College of the Canyons. I am also a theater faculty member. The Academic Senate is charged with making recommendations to the Santa Clarita Community College District with respect to academic and professional matters, but we also have the opportunity to work with the College of the Canyons Foundation and the district to sponsor important, inspirational academic events like this. It is with tremendous pride that I welcome you to the scholarly presentation, a special biannual event that highlights the exceptional quality of our faculty and their individual expertise. Scholarly presentations are in part due to the work and dedication of the Scholarly Presentation Committee who selects the speaker each year. The committee is composed of faculty who, from various disciplines who themselves are past presenters. I thank the committee and the committee's chair, Communication Studies Professor David Stevenson, for their time and unique interest to the college community and to the community at large. Before I introduce David Stevenson, who will introduce the speaker, I want to extend a special welcome to our chancellor, Dr. Diane Van Hook. And our assistant superintendent, vice president of instruction, Dr. Jerry Buckley, who I believe is trying to get here from car issues, without whose collective support this evening would not be possible. I also want to thank, uh, welcome and thank the members of the Board of Trustees of the Santa Clarita Community College District who have joined us this evening. Joan McGregor. <laughs> Michelle Jenkins, the Chair of the Board of Trustees. And Bruce Fortine is with us as well. The genuine support of the board is essential to the success of programs such as the one you are about to witness tonight, and we sincerely appreciate it. I also want to thank the COC Foundation for its generous sponsorship of the annual scholarly presentation. Murray Wood is here representing the foundation. And now, without any further ado, I want to introduce Communication Studies faculty and Scholarly Presentation Chair, David Stevenson, who will introduce our speaker. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming to uh, the end of our 18th year now of Scholarly Presentations, and I know that you're going to really enjoy tonight's program. Uh, Paul has uh, done a lot of thank yous, but as the chair of the committee, I also need to do some thank yous as well, so if you'll bear with me for a second. Uh, the, the Board of Trustees, the Administration Foundation, and you've met all of them already, so the committee would like to thank them as well. My great committee uh, that I work with, and uh, I, I do love all of the work that we do together, and it's a terrific committee. The Public Information Office does a great job of getting all of the information out to the community and to uh, the college. The theater staff and all of the unpaid volunteers that are here tonight, and then all of the lighting stage crew, all of those folks, we couldn't do it without you, thank you. There's graphics people involved, art people, audiovisual people. Cougar News is here tonight, and they're going to be videotaping the presentation and they will have an uplink to YouTube, so try to pay attention for that in the future. Dave Brill and Cougar News is trying, going to try and get that up as soon as possible. Um, tonight, after our presentation, uh, Dr. Del Alonzo is retiring, and so we're hoping that all of you, hopefully all of you, will be able to stay afterwards for the awards presentation that we're going to have um, our speakers tonight are going to be uh, Joan McGregor from the Board of Trustees, Chancellor Van Hook, and uh, Dr. Jerry Buckley will be coming up afterwards. So if you do need to leave, you have a 7 o'clock class. If you could leave quietly and maybe go out the sides, that would be great. But we have a big presentation tonight afterwards. I have the distinct honor of introducing tonight's speaker to you, Dr. Adele Alonzo. She was born in Havana, Cuba. She has earned her bachelor's degree at Montclair State University in New Jersey 
in modern languages, Spanish and French. She earned her master's degree in counseling at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California, and she earned her doctoral degree in education from the University of Laverne. She has taught Spanish, French, and English as a second language at the high school level. She's taught counseling classes for graduate students pursuing master's degrees in counseling at the University of Laverne. Adele was a high school counselor for many years in inner city schools and in the William S. Hart High School District. She's been a counselor and counseling faculty at COC for 16 years and specifically have counseled math, engineering, and science achievement, that's our MESA program, students since the beginning of the program at COC. At COC, she helped develop the curriculum and teach the Counseling 142 course, Learning to Learn, that explains how the brain works and teaches strategies to optimize the learning process. I'm happy that we have so many faculty, staff, and community members here tonight. It's my great pleasure to bring to you Dr. Adele Alonso. Good evening. Good evening. If I could open up my skull, take up my brain, and hold it in my hands, I would note that the human brain weighs approximately three pounds, that it is divided into two halves, and it's about the size of my two fists held together. The two halves mirror each other. Let me show you. Here's the brain. Here are the two halves, and they mirror each other. The two halves are also held together by nerve fibers called the corpus callosum. I invite you to stand up. Please stand. And I'm going to ask that you simply mirror me, OK? If I could open up my skull, take out my brain, and hold it in my hands, we would all notice that the human brain weighs approximately three pounds. <laughs> that it is the size of our two fists loosely held together, that it's divided into two halves that mirror each other, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, and that the both halves are joined together by the corpus Colossum. Please turn to someone next to you, and I want you to show and tell what you just learned about the brain. Go to it. Okay, thank you. You may be seated. Thank you so much. You're a good crowd and good sports. Thank you so much. For some of you, you may have just learned some new information. And notice that when I wanted you to learn this information, I had you hear it, see some visuals, talk to each other about it, and then actually act it out so that you are physically engaged in the experience. I want you to remember this as we go on through the rest of the presentation tonight. I wanted to start my talk tonight with the brain because it is an amazing organ that's responsible for thinking, decision-making, problem-solving, and learning. And especially in a world that's becoming more and more complicated, it is important for us to 
navigate through this complicated world by being able to access new information, process that information, and remember it. So the days of basic literacy, of simply reading to learning to read and write and do computational work are long gone. We live in a complex world that demands us to navigate a global economic system, innovative technology, and complicated international politics. It's imperative then that if we want to continue to grow, evolve, and thrive, that we learn to become critical thinkers and learn to be creative problem solvers. And in fact, we must learn how to learn. We must be prepared to assimilate new information, adapt to new complexities, and respond to new ideas for a future that is absolutely unimaginable to us right now. I've been a teacher and a counselor for a very long time. And throughout my career, I have developed an interest in the science of learning, mainly because I encounter students over and over who are frustrated by the fact that they have studied long and hard, and then they earn a poor grade on the test and say, Adele, what happened? I studied so much, and I, I, didn't, I wasn't as successful as I wanted to be. In fact, in 2007, Dr. George Q of Indiana University, he's famous for an annual survey of student engagement. He wrote about how most entering college students lack both the academic preparation and the study skills to be successful. And so I've been intrigued to find out and learn more about the behaviors and attitudes that make for successful college students, successful learners. And I've been curious to learn what it takes to be the good student, what effective study strategies look like and how they work, and how does all of this contribute to deep and lasting learning at any age. Fortunately, as a counselor, I feel we're li living in extraordinary times in which there's an outpouring of scientific work on the brain and on the process of learning. And all this science has great implications for counselors because educational counselors um, gain information from both psychology and education. And since the 1990s, the rise of medical imaging equipment has made it even more clear to us how the brain functions, how does it work, how does it acquire knowledge, and how does it store it. Thank heavens then for MRIs, PET scans, CAT scans, and something new to me, DTIs, diffusion tensor imaging. But the scientists now can see the anatomy and the physiology of the brain like they have never seen it before. We're learning more and more about how the brain processes information and how it relates to learning. So what is learning? In psychological terms, learning is the collection of information from the environment the processing of that information so that you can store it inside the brain, and then you can come back later, access that information, retrieve it, and be able to apply it. That's how cognitive psychologists see it. How the scientists see it is learning is the connection between the cells in the brain and how those connections are strengthened. So tonight, what I want to do is I want to share with you, and I'm excited about sharing with you, what the research shows regarding the brain, learning, and effective study skills. I want to bring some of that scientific research to your own personal, individual learning experience. By the end of the evening, you will be able to wipe. Oh, faculty in the audience, right? Student learning outcomes. 
yes. We teachers have to write student learning outcomes for all of our classes. So by the end of this evening, you will be able to identify seven basic learning strategies. And you will also learn a little bit about the brain and how it processes information. So I've divided my presentation into two parts. So I'll go over the learning principles first. I'll explain them. And then we'll move on to part two, where you'll see how the brain functions inside and how it processes information through stages so that you can learn how to store information in long-term memory for a long time. OK, so here are the seven principles. The Commission on Behavioral and Social Sciences and Education of the National Research Council, you may know it as the NRC, published a report in 1999 after two years of studying the science of learning. The report is called How People Learn. And they looked at all the research on learning to write this report. And their purpose was to link the findings of the scientific work and scientific data to the actual practice in the classroom. The efforts were led by a team of education experts, led by Dr. Ann Brown, who's from UC Berkeley's school, Graduate School of Education. I want to share with you some of the principles that were in that report. So that's the source of some of these, and then others that I have added from all my reading and my own research work. Principle number one is learning with understanding. It's not good enough to memorize information. It's important that one learn with understanding, that as a learner, you engage in a learning process committed to learning, motivated to learn, wanting to own that knowledge, make it yours. So you want to learn more fully, deeply, thoughtfully, so the information gather has meaning to you in your own lives. A true learner gathers knowledge and skill not just to answer questions on a test and get a good grade, not just so you can go on a game show on TV and win the trivia game, but because you want the knowledge and skills to improve your life, lives, uh, your own life and the lives of those around you. You want to practice these skills and learn experiences and knowledge to improve your professional life, too. So for example, and I hope David uh, Andrews is in the audience. We study history and political science, not just so that we know what the three branches of government are, right? But because we want to become better citizens, and we want to be able to be good citizens that when we vote and we elect legislators, that we think critically and make good informed decisions. Because they impact our daily lives. The second principle is linking to prior knowledge. The brain is not a blank slate. So every time you learn something, you build on that learning. It's like a scaffold. You learn something, and then you learn something new, and your brain wants to connect those dots, right? So that you can learn more fully and understand the big picture. It's not just learning a little data here and a bit of information here and a bit of information there. You want to connect all the dots to get a whole picture of a topic or understand a larger concept of something. It's important when you're learning to process new information and be careful about what prior preconceptions you have or what faulty learning you have had before. So as you learn, you need to learn well and have a good foundation so that you can add to it. If your foundation is faulty, it will interfere with learning new information and making those connections. We'll move on to principle three. Metacognition. Here's a big word. I want you to notice how for every principle I have put on the slide, not a lot of verbiage, not a lot of text, but I've selected a symbolic graphic, a symbolic picture, because I want your brain to make a connection between the principle 
and a visual. And sometimes the brain will remember the visual more quickly than actual text, so you can help your brain that way by processing both language and the visual cue. The research has found that learners perform better when they focus on making sense of their learning and thinking about and reflecting on how it is that they learn. So metacognition is thinking about thinking or thinking about learning. Think of metacognition as a conversation that you have with yourself. I'm learning biology and I stop and think, am I understanding this? Do I need more help with this? Do I need to go to a tutor? Uh, where, what have I understood and what haven't I understood? And what have I done so that I acquire this knowledge? And what have I done that didn't help me learn? So a good learner does that, has this conversation with himself or herself to say, how am I learning, what works, and what doesn't work for me? Because if you can analyze that, then you can make corrections and you can make adjustments to your learning process. That also means that metacognition requires that a learner set a goal, a learning goal, and then monitor their process toward achieving that learning goal. Principle four is distributed practice. It is important to be realistic about the amount of time it takes to learn, particularly complex subject matter. In 2006, the researchers linked beliefs that learning is quick with poor performance. Many students think that they can read the chapter the day before the class or study for the test the night before. It doesn't work really well. It is not enough. Learning is slow, it requires effort, it requires motivation. It requires distributed practice over time. And even better, if you get feedback so that you can improve the learning process. So if you get feedback from your professors, terrific. But you too should be giving yourself that feedback, right? Because of metacognition. So you're doing your practice and you're trying to analyze do I need more practice? Or have I had enough practice? And it doesn't apply just to book learning, right? Anyone here who's an athlete knows that you need to practice, and then you need to think about what you're doing and make corrections, whether you're batting at a baseball game or you're trying to lob on the tennis courts, right? Dr. Richard Mayer, who's a professor of psychology at UC Santa Barbara and a learning specialist, explained in 2008 that another important feature of deliberate practice lies in continually practicing a skill at more challenging levels each time. So don't be satisfied with the minimum. You want to learn, and then you want to build upon that learning because your brain likes the novelty, your brain really wants to learn, and you'll get bored if you stop at a certain level. Clearly, significant learning requires dedication and time and effort. Principle five is known as chunking, and all the counselors teach this, of course, in our classes. Perhaps one of the most widely taught and wisely used strategies, but it's used to improve memory performance because what it does is it organizes information that at first may not seem clear to you. So you can get a lot of information and it doesn't mean anything. But if you look at it and you chunk it into smaller pieces and find meaning in the small pieces, it'll become much more clear to you. And you can see that from the graphic, right? Just a string of letters or do the letters actually mean something? This is important to remember because organizing knowledge is very important for storage into memory. In a classic paper, Dr. George Miller, a cognitive psychologist who has taught in many Ivy League universities, spoke and wrote about the magical number seven. You notice how many principles I'm teaching you tonight? Seven? There's a reason for that. 
Dr. Miller said that seven is the magic number, that that's how many pieces of information the brain can handle. And it may be why our telephone numbers are seven digits, right? Three and four. And when we added area codes, we chunked them. Area code, prefix, the four numbers. It's easier to remember that way. So when dealing with a lot of information, it's helpful to organize it, group the information to no more than seven meaningful sets. When reading, don't just read the whole page. My students say they do this. They say, Del, I read, I read, and I don't remember anything. Because I know what you're doing. You start at the top, and you read, 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 get to the bottom and go, what did I just read? I don't remember a thing. So use chunky. You should chunk it and read a small passage. Stop. Check for understanding. Did I understand? What, do I, what is the textbook telling me? What does it mean? Are there words I don't understand that I need to look up? Let's hope it works. So when you read, you want to chunk the information so that before you move on, you understand the section, you can move on to the next section and the next section. Just like a book is divided into chapters or a textbook is divided into sections, any reading, whether it's a scholarly article, um, a professional journal, or any other kind of book, chunk the information and you'll find yourself being much more engaged in understanding much more than if you just read through the whole thing. Okay, here's, let's see if it works. It does. Whew. Okay, next principle. Oh my goodness, this is such important information. It's fairly recent. But um, Dr. Carol Dweck is a professor of psychology at Stanford University, and she's been doing research in the theory of mindsets. And Dr. Dweck says that there are two kinds of people. There are some people in this world who have a fixed mindset. They're just locked into thinking that you're either born smart or you're not so smart. So people with this kind of a mindset give up easily. They see a challenge, they see an obstacle, and why bother trying? They're not that smart, so forget the challenge, forget the obstacle, give it up. Um, in contrast, that people with a growth mindset believe you can actually get smarter. You can actually earn more and more knowledge, build on that knowledge, and you'll find out later why it really is true when I tell you about the, the brain again. But that's a big contrast, right? The people with the growth mindset are those people that persevere, they're persistent, they don't give up. They get a bad grade and they go knocking on the door to the professor and say, I took this test, I don't understand it, help me, what am I going to do? Or they find friends and they form a study group and say, what did you get? Let me show you what I got. I missed this problem, how do you work it out? They will not give up and it doesn't matter how long it takes because people with a growth mindset, those people really want to learn for the sake of learning. They want that knowledge. Michael Jordan used to say, um, play hard to win, but practice even harder and not give up. I want you to take a look at some people who persisted, embraced challenges, and went on to After being cut from his high school basketball team, he went home, locked himself in his room, and cried. He wasn't able to speak until he was almost four years old and his teachers said he would never amount to much. Was demoted from her job as a news anchor because she wasn't fit for television. Fired from a newspaper for lacking imagination and having no original ideas. At 
at age 11, he was cut from his team after being diagnosed with a growth hormone deficiency, which made him smaller in stature than most kids his age. At 30 years old, he was left devastated and depressed after being unceremoniously removed from the company he started. A high school dropout whose personal struggles with drugs and poverty culminated in an unsuccessful suicide attempt. A teacher told him he was too stupid to learn anything and that he should go into a field where he might succeed by virtue of his pleasant personality. Rejected by Decca Recording Studios who said, we don't like their sound, they have no future in show business. His first book was rejected by 27 publishers. His fiancée died, failed in business, had a nervous breakdown and was defeated in eight elections. If you've never failed, you've never tried anything new. Imagine if Dr. Seuss had given up, what would we have done as children? Okay. The next learning principle is self-regulated learning. Dr. Myron Dembo is a professor at USC, and um, I and some of the other counselors here had the privilege of working with Dr. Dembo, who came to COC and helped us write our Counseling 142 Learning to Learn class. And Dr. Dembo is a very prolific writer. He has written 70 articles. He's written three textbooks. Um, he does a lot of speaking, professional speaking. And I've read a lot of his work, but as a learner, I can't possibly remember all that information. So one of the things that I did in trying to help myself remember what Dr. Dembo says self-regulated learning is, I read all that and then sat down and summarized his work. Summarizing is a very, very good learning strategy because when you summarize, you have to take the totality of what you're learning and then distill it down to the essential concepts. Right? What is the most important thing about it? And in the end, what he talked about was that students who are self-regulated learners or anyone who's a learner, if they want to take control of their learning, if they want to own their learning, and not depend on someone else, not the teacher, not the parents, not their friends or other people, although you want help, you, it is your learning that's important, right? To you, you're gonna benefit from it. So as a self-regulated learner, you need to manage six things. And notice again what I did, I created these six phrases, and then I chunked them. So I chunked them into three and three, because that's easier for me to remember. I also use the mnemonic device. A mnemonic device is a memory trick that uses either sounds or words or a letter to trigger a memory and help you remember something. So I distilled all that work into six phrases that would be easy for me to remember. I chunked the information, and then I used the mnemonic device. The six components of a good, successful, self-regulated learner then are Students who use their time well, students who use their physical environment, students who use their social environment. Use of time means that you're going to manage your time and balance your obligations between work and school and family in your personal life. Good students find a way to manage all that. They also manage how they proceed within a class or within learning a particular topic. 
So if you have a big project, you break it down into small steps so that they're achievable, one piece at a time. If you have a lot of reading to do, go back to distributed practice. I'll, I'll read a little bit each night. You manage your time well so that you're not stressed, because stress does terrible things to your memory, and you learn to use your time well. The physical environment is where you study. So it's important as a self-regulated student to know when do you have to study by yourself so there are no distractions, and that means do you go to the library, do you go to your room, or are you gonna sit at the kitchen table or at Starbucks when there are lots of interruptions and lots of people coming and going. So if you need to regulate yourself as a learner, you need to know at what point you need that privacy and that quiet space, and at what point do you need to have a conversation and share the learning experience perhaps with a study group. The use of social environment is using human capital. At what point do you reach out for someone else to help you? So a self-regulated learner says, I don't understand this, it's not clear to me, I need to have someone help me. And that student will know, I'm doing research, I'll go to the librarian. The librarian can help me with research. Or it's a particular problem on a test that I took, I'm gonna to go to Dr. Demergen's office and I'm going to help have her help me with my trick. Or do you say, I need to form a study group because I can't learn this by myself and I have friends that are in the same class and they're doing well, so perhaps we can help each other out. Using others to help you, whether it's the professor, going to the library, forming a study group, or looking up information from an expert on the computer. It's knowing when you need to reach out for other people to help you in that process. The three M's are methods of learning, monitoring performance, and motivation. Methods of learning are like your little toolbox, right? And you put everything that you use to learn in that toolbox. So highlighting when you read, circling, outlining, uh, making flashcards, conjugating foreign verbs over and over and over and over again, um, learning vocabulary and defining vocabulary. Those are all the tricks, all the tools that you keep in your toolbox. And it's important for you to add to that toolbox as you monitor your learning, as you use metacognition and you learn what works well for you and what doesn't, so that you keep that toolbox with you whenever you're learning something. It's important to have that. Monitoring your performance is knowing where you stand in your learning. So you set yourself a goal. I am going to get an A in political science. And then everything you do that's going to bring you to that goal. So you know, I've taken three tests. This is the average of those tests. I've got so many points in that class. I know what I need to get on that final. And I have students like that. They can tell you, oh no, I'm sure I have a C plus. If I take this test, I can get this many points. And then by the final, I'll have this. I've turned in this many assignments and I'm missing other, this many other assignments. That's a self-regulated student. The student who says, I don't know what grade I have in this class and there's lots of students like that. Um, you need to learn to monitor your performance. You need to keep track of your tests and grades and um, your essays and how well you understand the lecture. It's really, really important that you take ownership of that. And that leads me to the last one and probably one of the most important, motivation. You know, there's intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic is when you motivate yourself, and extrinsic is when someone else is motivating you, like mom and dad, um, or the thought of a career in the future. But regardless, it's your education, it's your grade in that test, it's your grade for the class that's going to go on your transcript, that transcript is going to be sent to the university. That transcript may need to be submitted for our employer to hire you. In the end, your learning in those grades is what's going to move you toward your future and your career. So don't depend on other people unless you invite them to be part of that support network. Don't say, gosh, my teacher was boring. Oh my goodness, that person is not organized. 
In the end, it doesn't matter. You want to learn for the sake of learning. You want to learn because you want to improve your lives. You want to better the country. You want to have a good future. So own your education. It's yours. Grab it and, and make it your own. The learning principles I just shared with you are key to a strong foundation. They can be applied to any subject or topic at any age, whether it's science, math, physics, welding, basketball. It does not matter. These principles apply to all of those experiences. They're strategies that good learners use and that all students can learn with motivation and practice. I ask that you keep these principles in mind as we move on to part two of the presentation, because I'm gonna talk more about the brain, and you will see how these principles correlate what is, with what is happening in the brain and how the brain processes information during the learning process. I love that picture. Um, Let's move on to examine what is happening inside the brain as you apply these seven learning principles we just reviewed to capture information, process it through stages, and store it into memory. In the 1960s and 70s, the brain was compared to a computer. I told Joe Gerda that. Um, and a concept model called information process was developed to explain how the brain, just like a computer, grabs information from the outside, like data entry. So you have input, information comes into the brain. You process it and you store it in, the, in your memory, just like the computer stores it in your hard drive. And then you can go back in, open up your file, and there's the information again. So for a long time, we've been thinking about the brain like it is a computer. Put information in, store it, pull the information out. In 1985, Robert Stahl of Arizona State University synthesized all the research about information processing. And more recently, David Souza, you must read his book, uh, adapted the model and presented in his now famous book called How the Brain Learns. Souza described how our brains capture information from the environment through our senses, and then it's up to the learner to process the information and actively move the information through three stages. So information comes in through the senses, and there's something you must do to move it to stage one, sensory memory. And there's something else you need to do to move it to stage two, working memory. And then you're gonna take a, another action to move it to long-term memory. So it's three steps. We learn what we see, hear, touch, taste, smell. That's how we capture information from our environment. So it's really important that you engage all the senses in the learning process. That's why I had you stand up and act out the brain and know that it weighs. Very good. Because you want to activate different parts of the brain and engage in the capturing of that information. Think of babies and how bright-eyed they are. They touch everything, want to put everything in their mouth. They're so excited about learning. And during those early years, the brain is growing exponentially. Well, I'm about to tell you that you need to do the same thing. Don't go putting things in your mouth. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that as a learner, at any age, you need to do the same that you need to approach the world with the same intense sense of curiosity and sense of wonderment and, yes, active engagement. So how do our brains capture information to move it into the brain when there's so many noises, so much before our eyes, so many sensations, temperatures, things that are going on around us? We can't possibly pay attention to it all. So what is it that we need to do? Well, the information comes into the brain through the senses, and it gets sent to this tiny little piece of your brain right in the middle of the brain called the thalamus. And the thalamus acts like a relay station. 
So information comes in from your senses, it goes to the thalamus, and then the thalamus is responsible for sending that information out to the appropriate part of the brain. So something comes in and the thalamus directs it to one part of the brain or another part of the brain or this part of the brain. Very clever little thing, the thalamus. And when it comes in, it can go to different parts of your cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex The cerebral cortex is the gray matter in your brain. So it's all the, the gray matter that's all folded and full of grooves. That's the cerebral cortex. And that is divided into areas called lobes. So I want to tell you what those lobes are. The parietal lobe, I'm going to say that again, parietal, parietal, starts with a P, is right at the top of your head. And the parietal lobe processes sensations, including pain. Hmm. Parietal starts with P. Pain starts with P. Guess how I remember that word? Link to, <laughs> remember the principle, remember the principle of link to prior knowledge? I know the sensation of pain. Now I have a new word. How in the world am I going to remember it? But if I think that parietal starts with P and pain starts with P, I always remember parietal. That's at the top of your brain. Above your ears are the temporal lobes. And guess what they process? What kind of information? Auditory information, sounds. That's easy to remember. When the information that you hear comes into your brain, it gets processed right above the ears, right by your temples. That's the temporal lobe. The next one's kind of funny. Auditory information, what you see, comes into your brain and gets routed to the back of your brain. So you actually have eyes in the back of your, of your head. And that lobe is called the occipital lobe. Occipital begins with the letter O. Oh, occipital. When I think of seeing things, I think of my glasses. I usually wear glasses. So that's easy for me to remember. Occipital begins with the letter O, and I think of the letter O, that I, just like glasses that I look through, and now I know they're in the back of my head. In the very front of your head is the frontal lobe, and this is where decision-making and problem-solving hap solving happens. So when you're frowning and trying to work out your taxes or studying for a test or whatever it is that you're doing, and you're so intent on, on what you're doing and concentrating so much and you're frowning, you're actually doing all that work right up here in the front of your brain, the frontal lobe. There are two other pieces I want to tell you about. There's a little um, structure at the very bottom. See the light yellow in the back? That's called the little brain. It's the cerebellum. And that's there, thank goodness, to keep us erect and balanced so we don't trip over ourselves. And then finally, the brain stem is what connects your brain to the extremities and the rest of your body so that you can direct your arms and the rest of your organs. So that's what's where information comes in for the senses and it gets processed in different places. But as you hear things and, and see things and feel things, there's so much in our environment and if you want to capture it, you have to select. You have to intentionally select the information that you're going to pay attention to. So in the classroom, or here, wherever you may be, if there's a lot going on, you're not going to pay attention to the person sitting next to you, or you're going to look out the window, or you're going to, with motivation and intent to learn, select to pay attention to what the teacher is saying. And that selection action is what moves information into stage one, sensory memory. Now I have some bad news for you. It stays in sensory memory seconds. So you pay attention to something, it comes in and out, down the drain, you lost it. And then you pay attention to something else, it comes in and you lose it again. 
So we're constantly paying attention to one thing and the other. Information comes in and then we lose it. Information comes in and then we lose it. So paying attention, not enough. How do you move information to stage two then? Well, after you select and pay attention, you have got to focus on that information and focus in a way where you actually drown out all the peripheral noises and distractions, and that's harder to do. But if you can truly focus and concentrate, and it takes practice, then you move information to stage two. And at that stage, at stage two, then you can begin to work with the information. And the longer you work with it, the longer it stays in your brain. So when you're studying for a quiz the next day, you can work with the information, take out your toolbox, do the distributed practice, you're working with the information, and as, and as you work with it, and the longer you work with it, it stays in your brain. But guess what? Maybe 24 hours, maybe 48 hours, and then you lose it again. Sadly, a lot of students stop there. So remember I started my speech by saying, gosh, my student says they worked so hard, they studied so hard, and then they still didn't do well on the test. And I realized when I talked to them, well, what did you do? How did you study? They stopped there at working memory. They were working with the information. They did the outline, and they made the flashcards, and they solved lots of the same math problems, and they read their notes, and they read the textbook, and they thought, well, I'm ready for that test. Well, you may be ready for the test that's going to be given to you the day after or two days later, but you're not going to remember the information by the end of the semester. And you're certainly not going to remember it for the next level of math or the next level of whatever course that you're taking. So again, you cannot stop there. So you select to move it to stage one, sensory memory. You then focus to move it to stage two, working memory. What do you do to move it to long-term memory then? And all along, you need to be motivated, so remember that. At stage two, those strategies that you're using are called rehearsal strategies because it's really practice and I want to give you a list. This is, these are some of the strategies that students use and say this is how they learn. But to move information to stage three, you have to grab that information and you need to encode it. That's a new word, encode. There are three things that you do to encode the information. You have to think about the information, you have to analyze the information, and then you need to organize it. Then it goes into long-term memory. You also have to link it to prior knowledge and make those connections from what you already knew about the subject and what's new, what's different, how does it change your knowledge or perception of the topic? And thirdly, you have to give the information meaning. It has to be meaningful to you. It has to make sense to you. And that is very hard. Think, analyze, and organize. Link it to prior knowledge and make it meaningful. Motivation and time on task alone only work when learning if encoding takes place. These three things is what puts information into your memory for a long time, like into, saved on your hard drive. Throughout the entire process, if you do not take the appropriate action, you lose the information and you can move on to the next step. Let me explain some of the strategies that you can use to encode. So when you think about information, I want to talk to you about two strategies. If you're reading material, a great strategy is to talk to the text. 
So talk to it. You're reading something, talk and ask. This poem is about an old man. Well, what does it mean by old? Is this a 60-year-old or an 80-year-old? And it says he has rivulets on his cheek. What does rivulets mean? You have to talk to the text, and you need to annotate to say, oh, this means this. Oh, he's talking about his grandfather, and he is old, and where did he live? And you have to have that conversation with the text. Because when you're doing that, you're thinking about it, and you're analyzing what you're reading. In the same way that if you're doing a math problem or a physics problem, and I know, I think it's Charles, one of our engineering students, who will be sitting um, trying to work on a physics problem or a math problem, he'll say, throw that problem on the whiteboard. And then he writes it on the whiteboard, and I can hear three or four engineering students sitting there thinking out loud, hmm, what should we do? Let's do this. Well, that didn't work. No, 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 you do that. They're thinking out loud as they try to problem solve. Those are great strategies for thinking, analyzing, and organizing information. Another thing you can do to analyze and organize information is to use a graphic organizer. So whether it's a T-chart so that you can compare two actions, two processes, uh, two characters in a novel, or any two things, right? right. Uh, Civil War, write information about the South on one side, the North on the side, and then you can contrast the two. Or you can use a Venn diagram, literature, comparing and contrasting characters. Or if you want to study relationships, not only use text or talking about it, but actually giving yourself a visual using a graphic organizer to show the relationships by using a mind map or a cluster map. Linking to prior knowledge. I have to thank my, my colleague, Michelle Labrie, taught me this in the psychology department. Um, I was talking about mnemonic devices and what could we use to help us remember things. And remember I told you a mnemonic device, you use sound or letters to help you remember things? So Michelle said to me, oh, I know one. My very educated mother just served us nachos. Anybody knows what those are? Yes, that's the order of the planets in our planetary system, from the sun outward. I was so fascinated by that. And she's right. If you look at the first letter, I can remember that phrase because it's so funny to me. My very educated mother just served us nachos. Well, if you take the M, the V, the E, the M, the J, those are the planets. It's Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. You're taking something you know, nachos, mother, right? And you're putting new information attached to something that you're familiar with and know. So anytime you create a funny sentences, uh, and there are many of them, right? This is just one. I want to share another one with you, and some of you may know this if you're Sherlock Holmes fans. It's called Methods of Loci or memory palace. But th here's another memory trick to link new information to old information. So visualize a place that you know really, really well, like maybe your own home. And you have a list of information that you need to remember, vocabulary words or anything else. So in your head, you visualize that place, maybe your home, and you take each thing from that list and in my mind, I'm going to walk from my bedroom out to the top of the stairs, and I'm going to put it on the banister, the first word on that list. And then I'm going to walk down the stairs, and at the bottom of the stairs, I'm going to hang the next thing on a doorknob. And then I'm going to go into the kitchen, and I'm going to sit the third thing on top of the stove. And then I'm going to go to the dining room and put something spread out on the table. I walk through that house, and I leave the information I want to remember in each room. Now I have to remember that list or that information, and guess what I do? I go back into my head, I think of my house, I walk out the bedroom to the top of the stairs, and I pick up the first thing, 
and then the thing that I left at the bottom of the stairs, and then what I put on top of the stove, and then what I put on top of the table in the dining room, and you collect all those pieces of information. It's a funny trick, but it seems to work. And people who go to um, like memory contests and competitions, they use this all the time. It's just a trick. But the principle is linking prior knowledge, something you know, with new information. The principle is still the same. To encode, I said you needed to give information meaning. Because meaning sparks interest and makes the information more readily accepted. Two ways to add meaning is to give information relevance and put it into context. So by relevance, I mean make sense of information in terms of your own world, your own culture, your personal life, your community. By contextual, I mean information does not stand alone, but it's connected to other information so that it's useful to you. You want to use that information for yourself and those around you in multiple contexts, now and into your future. So when you're learning something, ask yourself, why am I learning this? Why is it important to me? How am I going to use it? How is it going to better my life? And that puts it into context and gives it purpose. Let's recap the information processing system. Please stand up. You said you were only going to do this once. Stand up. OK, so this time, I'm just going to ask you to watch me and please mirror my gestures. For information processing, information is out there in the environment. And you're going to select information to move it to stage one, sensory memory. Then you're going to focus on the information to move it to stage two, working memory. And then you work, work, work with it, right? And then you grab that information and encode it to move it to long-term memory and store it in your hard drive. And there are three things that you need to do to encode it. You need to think about it and organize it. You need to link it to prior knowledge. And you need to give it meaning. Thank you. You may be seated. Hey, hang in there. I've just got a little bit more to show you. So you learned about the cerebral cortex and all the different lobes. Now let's dig in deeper. And I want to tell you that the cells in the brain are called neurons. And here's a neuron. That's a funny looking neuron, but it works. The neuron's made up of dendrites, the body cell, a little tail called the axon, and then terminals on the other end. And the way the neuron works is information comes in, it travels through the dendrites, through the body cell. There's an electrical charge that zips down the axon. The axon is protected by a myelin sheath, just like your arm is protected by your skin. And in the end, that electrical charge initiates a chemical release. And that chemical release jumps the gap to another neuron, down the dendrites, through the body cell, zips down the axon, releases the chemical. When you're learning, that's what's happening in your brain. The neurons, the cells are connecting, and they are like a little batter, all the little batteries in all your neurons, and they're just firing away. I know Dr. Pamela teaches her students, it's like their brain's having a party up there. Neurons use both electrical and chemical signals to communicate with one another. And each brain cell acts like a battery generating this action. The electrical charge that comes down the axon stimulates the release of the chemical. The chemical jumps the gap and connects to another dendrite, and then down the next neuron. In fact, when all the neurons connect, your brain looks like a forest of neurons. There's actually three neurons, but I gave you the basic neuron. It actually looks like an absolute forest. Learn and use the information. Your dendrites grow. The neurons connect. And the more you use that knowledge, the more you apply it, the stronger the connections are. 
So Dr. Dweck was right. We can get smarter because if you learn deeply and learn well and you're a self-regulated learner, you are changing and altering your brain. You're growing more connections. And the more you use that knowledge, the more it connects, the deeper you're learning, and you're actually changing the structures in your brain. I want you to see how you can change the brain. Not so long ago, many scientists believed that the brain did not change after childhood, that it was hardwired and fixed by the time we became adults. But recent advances in only the last decade now tell us that this is simply not true. The brain can and does change throughout our lives. It is adaptable, like plastic. Hence, neuroscientists call this neuroplasticity. How does neuroplasticity work? If you think of your brain as a dynamic, connected power grid, there are billions of pathways or roads lighting up every time you think, feel or do something. Some of these roads are well-traveled. These are our habits, our established ways of thinking, feeling and doing. Every time we think in a certain way, practice a particular task or feel a specific emotion, we strengthen this road. It becomes easier for our brains to travel this pathway. Say we think about something differently, learn a new task or choose a different emotion. We start carving out a new road. If we keep traveling that road, our brains begin to use this pathway more and this new way of thinking, feeling or doing becomes second nature. The old pathway gets used less and less and weakens. This process of rewiring your brain by forming new connections and weakening old ones is neuroplasticity in action. The good news is that we all have the ability to learn and change by rewiring our brains. If you have ever changed a bad habit or thought about something differently, you have carved a new pathway in your brain and experienced neuroplasticity firsthand. With repeated and directed attention towards your desired change, you can rewire your brain. If you use your neurons, if you study, if you learn, you will create connections. If you learn something and you don't use it and you don't learn it deeply, there's a, um, a term called pruning. You actually shrink up your neuron and it can die. That's why no matter what age and as we age, we should continue to learn so you can continue to keep those neurons healthy. And careful with stress, it's very dangerous to the neurons. But it's important to know then that we can continue to learn, that the more you focus and code and use the principles I have described tonight for information processing, the better your neurons will connect, the neural pathways will strengthen, so that you are sure to become a more effective and confident and successful learner. Learning is not a spectator sport, it is a contact sport that requires learners to be fully engaged, motivated, willing to work out their, our brains. That's the message I have for you tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Best wishes for happy learning and college success. I know, we have, I know we have a lot of people who are leaving, but we also have some presentations coming up. And for the students, uh, you won't be receiving your tickets for your extra credit until after the presentation, so. Oh, okay. A little incentive there. Anyway, I'd like to bring up on stage uh, members of the Board of Trustees. Thank you. It's represented by uh, Joan McGregor. Our Chancellor, Dr. Diane Van Hook, and Dr. Jerry Buckley, and they all have presentations for Adele. I want to say thank you to everybody for attending tonight. After our final presentation, then you can go get your tickets, okay? And then for the faculty and staff, we have a reception afterwards where you can spend some time talking with Adele. All right, here's Joan.
I think you all realize now, especially the students that are here, how fortunate you are to have professors like Dr. Adele Alonso. I think it provides an opportunity for all of us to learn. Uh, we're lifelong learners. Uh, students here today, uh, tonight, I hope that you would take a lot of information that's been given you tonight, use those study skills, use those memory skills, use the information that was given to you as you pursue your careers and your life. It's so important and I, I want to thank Adele and I want to tell you just personally, I had an opportunity to sit through one of her classes and I felt so fortunate to see the students as they blossomed in her class, as they learned, uh, as they uh, pursued what they are going to be doing in the rest of their life. It was a career class. So I just really enjoyed that counseling experience. With that, I'd like to present this, which is uh, from the College of the Canyons Foundation. Uh, the Board of Trustees agrees that the annual scholarly presentation, Dr. Adele Alonzo, the brain, learning, and study skills in recognition of your support, May 21st, 2015. Adele, congratulations. I should introduce our Chancellor, Dr. Diane Van Hook. Thank you. Ooh, it's bright up here. How'd you do that? Um, it's my uh, honor to be here this evening, and I have the pleasure of uh, presenting Adele with flowers that are beautiful and blooming. And, and it's symbolic to me. Last Friday night, I was at the Mesa dinner. How many of you are Mesa students in the audience? Well, let me tell you what, our Mesa students are really, really lucky. Adele has been the Mesa counselor for 12, 14 years. Monday afternoons and early evenings were sacred. You did not dare to try to uh, expect Adele to be, to come to, ha to talk with you or to meet with you to solve a problem or to come to a meeting because that was Mesa time. And I sat in that audience and I watched these students pay tribute to Adele Alonzo for being their counselor. But really what they were doing was they were paying tribute to her for helping them grow and helping them blossom. We did a study last uh, year at COC and we asked our students, what are the most important things that help you be successful? One of them was, I need direction. That's what counselors do, they provide direction. Another was, I need to focus. That's what counselors do. They help students refocus on the target that they're trying to get to. The third was, I need to be able to feel part of what I am engaged in. I need to know that I'm part of something bigger, which of course Mesa and the Mesa Center is all about, as is most of what we do with our students in the learning setting at College of the Canyons. The fourth thing they said was, I need to be able to demonstrate and show what I have been able to learn to do and I need to be able to give back. But the most important thing that our students said about what helps them persist to be successful and to complete is they need to know that someone else notices them and someone else encourages them. And that's what Adele has done in her counseling career here. It's what she's focused on in Mesa and in her professional relationships, letting people know that she was paying attention, she was gonna help keep them focused, she was gonna support them, and they would be successful. So Adele, it's my pleasure to present you with these flowers which symbolize you helping other people grow. Thank you very much. Good evening. I have the honor of representing the foundation this evening as a foundation board member. The foundation proudly supports academic and instructional programming here at the college and awards 20 mini grants each year to faculty members who develop new, innovative, and entrepreneurial projects that directly benefit our students. We also support academic scholarship with scholarly programs such as the one you've seen this evening. 
On a personal note, as the uh, Chief Instructional Officer, I would just like to uh, give you a, a little bit of an interpretation of my interactions with Adele over the past couple of years. There are certain words that come to mind for me from my long-term memory. <laughs> Professional, leader, intelligent, compassionate, role model, expert, academician, counselor. All these words describe Dr. Adele Alonso, and she has other qualities that go beyond words as a human being in the truest sense of that phrase, as Adele has a sensitivity to the human spirit. She represents what is best in a counselor and in our college. It has been my greatest pleasure to call her colleague over the past two years and to share in some of the projects that he, she has led for the benefit of both faculty and students. My congratulations to her this evening on a thoughtful presentation and your scholarly presentation to the Academy. On behalf of the Foundation, I'd like to present you with a small token of appreciation for your efforts and achievement in presenting the brain, learning, and study skills. On behalf of instruction, Dr. Alonso has been an integral part of College of the Canyons, and she shall be missed. And with that, we're done. Thank you so much.